Nine o'clock. Um, okay. Whoop, whoop. Really tripping over the furniture. Okay. So, so uh, this is the last uh, technical session of the, the course. So on Thursday, we'll, um, Kira, Dr. McGraw will be going through some revision strategies with you. Uh, but today we'll finish off looking at attitude, determination, and control. Um, what we looked at last week, uh, we covered why we need control systems, why we need attitude uh, determination, what the various disturbance torques are acting on the spacecraft, so the aerodynamic, the magnetic, the gravitational, and the solar radiation pressure, all of those things that cause these torques that we need to be able to counteract, but also the fact that we need to be able to control a spacecraft if we want to repoint it to look at specific parts of the sky or specific parts um, of the, the ground. Um, we, t we looked at how we estimate torque requirements for different types of maneuvers. So very quickly, briefly at the end, we looked at if we're doing a slew maneuver or if we're um, trying to maintain, um, uh, so, so trying to do that momentum dumping that we've got as we're building up torque. So today I want to finish off looking at attitude determination hardware. So I actually, how do we determine our attitude from our spacecraft, what sort of hardware do we use, what sort of references can we use in order to, to, to uh, understand where our spacecraft is pointing, and also attitude control hardware, so how, how do we actually make sure our spacecraft points in the right direction and uh, control the direction that we're pointing in. So have we got any questions before we start, or are we fairly happy just to, to dive in? Yeah. Hopefully, this is a few slides, so hopefully we, we might finish a little bit early, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, so in terms of um, sort of knowing where we want our spacecraft to point, or determining our attitude, uh, we've got a number of different references that we can use. So these are uh, points of reference that we can say we, if we're, we know from what direction that point of reference is, we can work out where our spacecraft is pointing. So one of these is the sun, so very big, bright star in the sky that we can definitely know what direction that is. Um, so it's very bright, it's very unambiguous. Um, we don't need very much power in order to be able to identify where, that sun, where the sun is, so we can use very low power sensors to do that. Um, you need to know the direction if you're using solar arrays to power a spacecraft, you'll need to be able to point those solar arrays in the direction of the sun. So you need to, at some point, know where the sun is, particularly for the solar-powered uh, spacecraft. Um, and you always need to know where it is if you've got telescopes or very sensitive equipment on board so that you don't blind them, so you don't suddenly point into the sun um, without knowing where it is. So it's, it's a good um, sort of reference to know um, but it may be eclipsed during certain periods of the orbit, so it can't, it's not always there as, as a reference direction. So you, you just need to be cautious of that. Um, and there's some sort of, there are some angular, um, angular diameter limits okay, to the accuracy that you can use the solar uh, reference vector as, as, a, um, as a reference point. Uh, you could also use a planet. So you can look down at the, the Earth's limb, so the edge of the Earth, and tell what direction you're pointing in based on that. You can know in what direction relation to this, the Earth that you're pointing. Um, it's always available to the spacecraft, because the spacecraft is, is sort of nearby, whatever planet it is. So Earth, obviously Earth-orbiting planets, it would be the Earth's surface. But if you were orbiting Mars, you might want to look at Mars's limb. So whatever uh, planet that you're orbiting, that's always there in the field of view for, this, for the spacecraft. So it's, it's a good um, direction. It's generally quite bright and unambiguous. So you can use relatively low power sensors. Um, and it's needed for some, a number of payloads. If you're observing the Earth or if you're observing Mars or whatever planet you're observing, you would need to know the direction of the Earth or the planet that you're orbiting, so it's important. Um, and it's relatively easy kind of to, an, to analyze. Um, you, for horizon sensors, you need to be scanning, so that means you might you need some sort of sensor that's moving in relation to that horizon to be able to detect where that horizon is. 
So, so that can be a challenge if your spacecraft's not spinning, or you might have to have some sort of spin component on board or sensor that spins. Um, most uh, uh, must protect the sensor from the sun, okay? So, yep, that's, uh, these sensors are very, very sensitive. So again, they can be damaged by pointing directly at the sun. So you need to be able to protect them, have some sort of hood over them, or know where the sun direction is. Um, and there's a limit to the accuracy that you can get with these. So about 0.1 degree is generally kind of the accuracy you can get. The magnetic field is another reference. So not all planets have a nice structured magnetic field like the Earth. Some of them are a bit, bit more unstructured. Certainly the Moon is quite unstructured magnetic field. But where there is a very good kind of reference for the magnetic field, and we know we have good knowledge of that, magnetic field, we can use that as a, a reference direction. So we can use that to, to kind of know where we're pointing. Um, it can be very cost effective in that respect because the sensors are quite simple and, and, and um, low power. And it's pretty much always there, okay? So we can't be blinded by it. So the sensors, uh, it doesn't matter if the sensors are pointing towards the sun, it doesn't, that doesn't blind them. So it's, it's quite a, a robust measurement in that way. But it's not great resolution. So about um, anywhere sort of greater than 0.5 degrees. So it's, it's kind of in, in respect to the planet's horizon or the sun as a point, um, both of them are much, much more accurate than the, the magnetic field. Um, and it's only near the Earth or near the planet's surface. Um, so as you get further away, that, that limits the accuracy. And as I said, for planets or, or planetary bodies or moons that don't really have a good magnetic field, clear magnetic field, then it's not really relevant, or magnetic field that we've mapped effectively. And in order to be able to very accurately measure it, your spacecraft has to be, or the sensor has to be, in a region that's very magnetically clean. So if you've got magnetic fields on board the spacecraft or some instruments that are going to interfere with that, then that, that can cause an issue. Um, so the final sort of reference vectors that we use, or reference directions, are the stars. So these are very far distant stars. Um, and we can use them, particularly if we're looking at inertial things. They're very, very accurate to 0 0.001 degree. Um, they're available anywhere, so you can have, it doesn't matter which stars you're looking at, as long as you use the patterns that are available and that you have knowledge of. Um, and we, so we've mapped out most of the stars in, that we can see in the sky in constellations and things. So we have good knowledge of what the star patterns are. Um, but you don't even need to know exactly what the patterns are. You can just um, map the tra track, kind of what those patterns are moving through your field of view. But this requires you to have a telescope. It requires you to have data on board, uh, data processing on board to be able to do that. So there's quite a lot um, it's quite a complex system, quite a heavy system. So a telescope, you can imagine it's got optics. Um, to be able to pick up, detect the signal of the stars, the very far distant light that's coming from them. Um, identifying the stars can be quite time consuming. or identifying patterns within the stars that we're tracking. So we don't have to necessarily... So there are things called star mappers, which actually identify particular constellations and patterns that we know of. Um, and then there are star trackers, which just pick up a pattern and look at how that pattern tracks across the, the field of view and use that. Um, so star mappers are, are more accurate. It gives us a much more accurate dead pointing reckoning. But star trackers then are a little bit more rapid in terms of their response um, because we don't need to look into a database to see what actual pattern is that. Do we map that onto which constellations we've got? Um, but Again, because it's a telescope, because it's got a, a um, very sensitive sensor, we can't use it when we're pointing directly at the sun. So there'll be a region where, around the sun where we're blinded or we need to protect our sensor from that. Um, and sometimes, with, particularly with star trackers, multiple stars can cause an issue. So if there's clumping together and it's difficult for uh, the, sensor, the algorithms to identify what those stars are, distinguished between those patterns, it can cause a difficulty. Okay, so any questions around any of that? Yep? So, so for noting the presence of star mappers and trackers, a mapper uses a database, right? Yes, so a mapper uses a database 
That's basically as if you've mapped the entire constellations. So it's referring, so it's finding out particularly what that pattern is. Whereas a star tracker just uses a pattern that it identifies and then sees how that pattern moves throughout the, throughout the motion of the satellite to be able to see what that rate, rate of movement is. Yeah? OK, so any, any other questions? Are we all fairly happy with that? OK, so these are the, the methods that we can use to determine our pointing, where we're actually pointing. Um, how we actually implement this on a, on a spacecraft, so on a spinner spacecraft, um, you might have, say, some sun sensor, so some sort of digital sensor that picks up the sun angle. Um, and then you might have another one on the other side. Generally, you won't have it. 90 degrees exactly, so you can be able to distinguish between the signals between the two different sensors. So you've got some sort of, because remember your spacecraft is spinning around, so you need to know which one it's spin, it's what is being kind of picking up the sun, the sun signal. Um, so, so that always helps if they're not exactly um, diametrically opposite to each other, then, then you can have a, a chance to understand which is which. Um, and they, they generally have a kind of fan-shaped region that they, they look into. Uh, you might also have uh, Earth Horizon telescopes. Um, and they will then be scanning naturally because it's spinning across the, the horizon of the Earth. And so you, you can use that then to detect the direction the spacecraft is pointing in. Um, so fan, those fan-shaped sensors direct the, this, detect the sun angle. So the, as the spacecraft's pointing, it can tell what direction the sun is is um, pointing to, or the, the direction the sun is. The Earth Horizon telescopes de de detect that direction where the Earth Horizon is. Um, and we can combine the knowledge of these two to actually determine where our spacecraft is, is pointing. So we get this sort of cone of the direction that we might, the sun might be in, and we get this cone of the direction that the Earth might be in. And where these two intersect, those are two potential directions that the spacecraft is pointing at. And we can rule out one or the other depending on which data the came from the sensors and the spinning. So that's why we don't have them diametrically opposite each other. So we just use that intersection to know which is more likely and which is more relevant. But we get two solutions, basically, from that. So any questions around that? So that's for spinner spacecraft. So remember, spinner spacecraft, we're using the spin of the spacecraft to kind of orientate the spacecraft and keep it in a fixed orientation. Um, so that was one way we could control the attitude of our spacecraft by using the spin and giving us, a bit like the, the little spinners we gave you last week, giving us that gyroscopic rigidity to keep the control of the spacecraft. So on a three-axis satellite, we've got um, Basically, you want to have two orthogonal <laughs> sensors, so maybe um, on, e on the uh, x and the y axis or something like that. You might have some sensors. So in this case, it's on the z and the y axis. Um, and your spacecraft can then rotate around the x axis if that's pointing towards the sun or around some axis close to that. So it's got some, some sun um, vector direction. It may not be particularly exactly along the x-axis, because generally our x-axis is pointing along our velocity vector, and our z-axis is pointing to, to the um, Earth. So that's nadir pointing. So the Earth would be somewhere up here. Imagine that blob is the Earth. Um, so we are, that gives us some sort of reference vector. We need an additional reference vector to be absolute, so something like an Earth or a star, point, star mapper, in order to be able to kind of really understand where, what direction we're pointing. So um, there's a kind of combination that we need to use, and then we need to fuse all of that data, as we did with, with the, the spinner, to be able to determine exactly the, the direction that we're pointing. Right. So any questions around that? I mean, it's fairly, fairly straightforward, I think. Just what sort of sensors do we need on board? So now we can go and look at the types of hardware that we've got. So we have these two different things. We've got our reference sensors, which tell us sort of um, give us a vector reference of where we're pointing. And then we've got inertial sensors, which tell us how, we're far, 
how we're drifting from that reference vector. So the inertial sensors are accelerometers, they're telling us our, our acceleration rates, but we need to have an absolute reference to give us the, the uh, if we know the drift from that initial reference point, then we can work out how, how far away we've gone from that. So a combination of our reference sensors and our inertial or acceleration sensors will help us understand in real time where the spacecraft is pointing. So, as I said before, some typical sensors are sun sensors. So this is what a sun sensor, a small sun sensor might look like. So it's got these kind of um, shielding area to shield out some of the sun so, so it knows kind of where the sun's uh, rays are coming in from and then it's, it'll have like a little CCD or a little set sun sensitive chip in, in there and it'll um, effectively like a solar panel so, so it knows so it's a, um, a PN junction that knows when it detects when sunlight falls on it and it creates a, a current creates a voltage um, we've got these earth horizon sensors so I said they've got these big telescopes to be able to kind of detect so they're relatively heavy but not, not so as heavy as star trackers but they, you might have them pointing in different directions on board the spacecraft so that when the spacecraft's spinning around it's got different, different um, fan attitudes that it can look at. And then finally a star sensor looks a bit like this. So you see it's got a big kind of telescope, this big hood region here is stopping the sensor from being blinded if it's going to be kind of moving towards the sun. Um, and then you've got probably optics in there and then that will plug into your attitude determination control system, there'll be a computer on board that can do all of the mapping um, and, and do, or do all of the tracking stuff. So those are what, particularly what those, that sort of hardware looks like. We've got any questions around that? No? Okay, um, so then we've got our inertial or acceleration sensors and these could be something like um, uh, space gyroscopes. So these are what we have on the ISS. These gyroscopes all packaged up um, and they can, they're spinning and so they, as, they, as the orientation of the spacecraft changes then that that's gyroscope will move within it because it's maintained, the spacecraft will move around it and then we'll be able to tell how that spacecraft is moving around those gyroscopes and then that, what that rate of change of the spacecraft is in relation to some f fixed attitude. You can get drift in these gyroscopes, so over time we need to be able to kind of reassess and that's where we use our reference sensors to reassess our direction because we get a little bit of gyroscopic drift over time, it doesn't always point exactly where at the direction um, as, it's, as it's spinning, there's this tiny little bit of drift. Um, depending on how good the gyroscope is, the drift is lower. So um, a more accurate gyroscope will have a, a very low drift rate, but there will still be a drift rate, so we'll still need to have some sort of absolute reference. Oops, sorry. Some sort of absolute reference from some of these types of sensors to be able to kind of realign the system. So we've got any questions around that? No? Okay. I know it's Monday morning, it's fairly... Okay, so we're happy to move on? Yep. Okay. Uh, so then how do we control our directions? Okay, so there we have our, our things that we call internal actuators and we have external actuators. So what do you think internal actuators are? Okay, um, but we could have an external actuator that is also located entirely within the um, vehicle's body. So, so, so an internal actuator doesn't, doesn't need anything from outside. It doesn't need a magnetic field. It doesn't need Newton's third law. It can work perfectly fine in anything because it doesn't need anything from outside. All so, it just needs is a bit of power and you're yeah. on Okay, so that's a bit more of an accurate description. It, it doesn't need an external force to make it. So we're not, we're not actually creating an external force on the spacecraft with, with our internal actuators. What we're actually doing with internal actuators are we are translating momentum from one axis of the spacecraft to another. So the total momentum of the spacecraft remains constant, but we just translate where that momentum is, on which axis. 
And that's important because we could, if one of our axes is spinning up because it's got a big solar panel and it's been acted on by solar radiation pressure and that's causing the spacecraft to spin in a particular direction, we can use a reaction wheel or a momentum wheel, okay, so these are our internal actuators, to translate the momentum on that one axis that we don't want spinning into the momentum wheel or reaction wheel, so it basically absorbs that momentum. And so it starts spinning up internally, but then the spacecraft is fixed. The rest of the body of the spacecraft starts to become fixed. Okay, so we're, we're just taking that momentum and, and kind of storing it somewhere. But what do you think happens over time if we store that momentum? Are we going to be able to infinitely store a momentum? No, so we need some way to release that momentum. So that's where we have external actuators. So, sorry, um, reaction wheels and control moment gyros, all internal actuators. <coughs> then we have our external actuators. So what do you think our external actuators? We've hinted at it before. What do you think our external actuators are? So we're using force externally to the spacecraft. So... Okay, <laughs> we'll give you a clue. We've got magnetorquers as one. Okay, so that magnetorquers are effectively electromagnets that are using the magnetic field to align themselves or align the spacecraft. So we can create a moment on the spacecraft using this external field to the spacecraft. Okay, so it's an external force that's acting on the spacecraft to turn it. So it's actually adding momentum to the spacecraft. So the, uh, the equation now for the momentum needs to incorporate um, the whole world, the Earth's magnetic field, if we want to look at balancing the momentum, because we've got an external force acting on it. What other external forces how could we use on our spacecraft? How else do we add momentum to our spacecraft, add energy? How do we get our spacecraft into orbit? Thrust. Okay, so thrust is adding energy, so it must be adding momentum. So we can use thrusters in a couple. So a pair of thrusters will create a torque, which is an external force which is going to act on the spacecraft. And that's going to give us an, uh, an external force that we could use to counteract the momentum that's been built up in these wheels. So that's what we mean by momentum dumping. So these wheels will saturate at some point. So they'll nicely absorb lots of all the different um, disturbances that are acting. And we don't want our thrusters to do that all the time, because if we were continuously using thrusters to counteract those disturbance torques, then our thrusters would be using an awful lot of propellant. Because they'd be going on and off and on and off, and there'd be some sort of limit cycle that they would reach. Um, and so we would use up our propellant very quickly. So what we want to do is put all of that momentum into a wheel over time, and then at a period of time, we do a big maneuver to release that momentum and zero the wheel uh, spin. And then we can go back to the beginning and use that. So it's a bit like a capacitor. It builds up. It stores the momentum for a period of time until we can then set that, the thrusters to do some sort of maneuver. So you need both. You need external torquers and you need internal torquers generally if you want to have a good attitude control system to be able to control your attitude. The internal torquers are sort of damping all the time, and then the external torquers are being used to dump the momentum. Oh, sorry, moved on. <laughs> okay, so any, any questions around that? Anything you're not quite sure about? No? Okay, so we can move on. I think, so uh, this is what our uh, uh, reaction or momentum wheel looks like. So you can imagine. Um, why do we want to put a lot of the mass on the outside of the wheel? It looks a bit like a bicycle wheel with all the mass kind of pointing on the outside. Yep. Increasing its moment of inertia. Yep. So, so, nice yep. so, so it's a bit like when I, when I said last week we've got um, our uh, ice skater and you're sticking your arms out. If you stick your arms out, you've got much higher mass moment of inertia where if your arms are there. And then as you pull them in, your, your mass moment of inertia reduces. So if you put all of your mass in the center, um, that's going to have a, a lower moment of inertia. So you want to make it as big as possible, ideally. But that's a challenge because obviously um, they're going to take up more space. So the volume wise, yep. So tell me if I'm right or wrong. So with this, so by putting all the 
mass on the outside, you're storing more energy at the same speed. Yes, okay, so you don't have to spin, yeah. So alternatively, you could have a smaller wheel, but you'd have to spin it faster. So the um, kind of challenges would be then be focused on your motor, on being able to spin up. So, so you probably still have to have more mass because your motor would have to be, have more windings, be more powerful, your electric motor, <coughs> in order to be able to spin that fast enough. So, so there's a trade-off there in design. Of, the, of these momentum wheels. And that's, that's what people would look at in terms of designing a momentum wheel, where you, where you put that trade-off, where you put that mass. But um, these are highly precision engineered wheels um, that are used around a fixed axis um, to change, either to change the rotation or the orientation, the rotation speed of the spacecraft, so you, you can change, um, so you've got reaction wheels which are used to actually move the spacecraft attitude, and then you have momentum wheels which are used to absorb momentum that's being acted on externally, or, or torques that are acting externally on the spacecraft. Uh, so they're used to store, as I say, momentum um, and offset disturbances. We can transfer momentum from the wheel to the spacecraft body or vice versa in order to be able to control um, the direction and pointing of the spacecraft. Um, and for three axes for full <coughs> control, you often have three wheels. You may even have more redundant wheel to, on another axis just to be able to offset. So, but at a minimum, you would need three in order to give full three axis control. Um, any questions around that? Do you want to understand how, what momentum wheels are and what they do? What reaction wheels are? The difference between a momentum wheel and a reaction wheel? Okay, functionally, they're, they're, or, um, they look very similar in their design, but uh, if you imagine a reaction wheel is there to cause a reaction in the spacecraft, so it's trying to change the direction of the spacecraft. Momentum wheel is trying to keep the spacecraft orientation the same and absorb the torques and the momentum disturbances that are acting on the spacecraft. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, if you have, consider a spacecraft, made it look like a, a little rocket in this case, so you know what the spacecraft is, and then, so the blue bit is the spacecraft, and the red, the, sorry, the green is the wheel. And the mass moment of inertia of the spacecraft is I spacecraft, and the mass moment of inertia of the wheel is J wheel. So that's a, the two we're looking at. Um, we've got some sort of torque acting on the spacecraft, um, and we've got some sort of, so we've got a control torque, Q, uh, T, Q, C, and we've got a disturbance torque, T, Q, D. And we've got some sort of reference axis that we want to point in the direction of, or, at, or that we want to keep as a reference, and we've got some sort of angle that we're uh, displaced with, a, with respect to that reference axis. Um, so if our spacecraft rotation, our omega is, um, or we're, we're in this case we're using theta, um, so theta dot will give us our rotational rate around that axis, okay? Um, and the wheel, if the wheel spin rate is omega in this case, so that's the wheel spinning in there, how fast the wheel is spinning is omega, how fast the spacecraft is spinning is going to be theta dot. So we've got two different rates of spin there. We've got the wheel spin, we've got the uh, spacecraft spin. Um, the wheel momentum then HW is given by the moment, mass moment of inertia of the wheel plus the spacecraft spin rate plus the wheel spin rate. Because remember the spacecraft, the wheel is inside the spacecraft, so it is also moving um, at that entire rate of the spacecraft, but it's spinning itself as well. So that's the total momentum of the wheel. And the spacecraft momentum then is given by the mass moment of inertia of the spacecraft and the, the spacecraft spin rate, so theta dot. We know the dot notation refers to the change in theta with time, so d, d theta dt is, if we, we put a single dot, have you come across the dot notation before? Yeah? So if it's a double dot, that means it's an acceleration, so single dot, uh, it's uh, just a rate, um, and double dot is dt squared, OK? 
Okay, so that's a, an acceleration. Um, so the total momentum then, uh, with the change in time, we can get this, so we sum it all up, is related to the, the external disturbance torque that's acting on it. So uh, the change in momentum on the spacecraft is related, is equal to this torque that's acting on the spacecraft. So the change in momentum over time. Um, and we can, we can um, devolve that into the two different components, the spacecraft and the wheel component. And you can see there we've uh, double dot because we're looking at acceleration now. Yep. Okay. And then we can take Laplace transforms of this equation. So this is the, uh, the sort of equation of motion of that, of that spacecraft. So we can take Laplace transforms. Have you heard of Laplace transforms before? You should have done that in maths this year. Okay. We're not expecting you to do Laplace transforms in these exams, but you need to understand where they're being applied. Why are you using them? Why are you learning about them in maths? Okay? Next year, when you do control systems, you'll be doing lots of Laplace transforms in earnest, and you'll be learning about how you take this equation in the time domain. Okay? There's a differential equation in the time domain. You use the Laplace transform, convert it into the frequency domain, into a nice algebraic equation in the frequency domain, and you can solve, you solve that equation to find the control requirements for that spacecraft or for that whatever um, vehicle that's in motion. So that's how, why we use, why we're learning about Laplace transform in maths, it's not just to torture you, okay? It is a very important uh, technique to be able to use in control systems. We're not going to get you to apply it in this course, but just be aware of it. Next year, you'll be doing control systems where you'll be doing quite a lot of Laplace transforms. So make sure you understand about Laplace transforms from maths. This is how it intersects in spacecraft sit the world. And it was the same with aircraft control or anything. Any, any type of thing that you're trying to control, you create a feedback loop. And you've got this dynamic equation that you want to solve so you can convert. Into the time, from the time domain into the frequency domain and get a nice algebraic equation that you can get the roots of and solve. And you can use that then to find the control law for that, for that vehicle or for that object. So any questions around that? Not the plus, but <laughs> around the other bits of that. So we're all fairly happy with that. Just a concept. So we're at, for, this, for this course, what you need to understand is the concept of how we're actually using these... Um, uh, components to, un to, to get our reference vectors to understand how we can control our momentum. Okay, so how do we then size these? Um, so we, we need to size them by the angular momentum capacity. Okay, so they must be able to store up, and this is what you were doing in the tutorial on Friday. You're looking at how you size the wheel, so you're working out what are all of these torques and moment, um, things that are acting on the spacecraft over the period of the orbit. And you must be able to then counteract that. So if, you're, if you've got some sort of uh, momentum that's acting the maximum torque, you want to estimate. And then you want to look at what the period is. So if it's, if it's cyclic, find out what the maximum torque is, find out what the RMS value is. Yeah? So that, that equation there just basically gives the, uh, if you know it's uh, acting in some sort of sinusoidal way over the or orbital period, you can just get the um, RMS value and work out what the sort of average torque it needs to be able to, to ma manage over that time. Okay, so, so rather than, or you could plot that equation and then integrate it, an easier way would just be to get the RMS value and assume then it's relatively constant. Okay, so then we can um, integrate over that to get the worst case and we can work out then what the maximum needs to be. For if we want to affect a particular change in angle, okay, so if we want to have a, a particular angular change, then again it would be the maximum over the time duration that we want that angle to happen over. Okay, so if we want it to happen really quickly, we're going to need more momentum in order to do that because we need to, going to our, our momentum wheel is going to have to store more momentum to be able to actuate over a much shorter time. Okay, so that's going to increase the, the size of the momentum wheel. So you can see it's directly proportional to the time, uh, time duration that we've got there. Okay, 
Any questions around that? Sorry. We're happy with that? Yep. Okay. So how, what's the hardware look like to actually control these? We've got, um, I mentioned before, our magnet torquers. So these are our external um, torquers. And they are generating these moments using the Earth's magnetic field. How do they do this? Uh, so an electromagnet, we've got to put a current through a wire, and it's got a wire coiled around some sort of central bar, some sort of central um, uh, mag mag bar, bar of material that can be magnetized, okay, that can create our electromagnet. But we've obviously got to put power in to get the current to go around. So that's, we've got to be able to calculate how much power do we need to, to generate this. Um, so they're basically rod-like magnets, so they might be orientated. You sometimes will see them in very small satellites. They might be built into the solar panels, and you'll see these kind of loops of, of uh, wire that will be used as a, a sort of uh, electromagnet, and the whole solar panel will have that kind of mounted on the back. Or you might have it built into various components within the spacecraft. Or it may be just a separate component all in itself that's a kind of tube that looks like a, a rod. Uh, bar magnet. Um, they're limited to sort of medium or uh, lower altitudes because what do we know about the Earth's magnetic field as we get further away from the Earth's surface? What happens to it? It's related to R squared, so that the strength of the magnetic field reduces as we get further away, so reduces with R squared. Okay. Um, you can't produce a torque. It, um, can only produ uh, can't produce a torque in the local field direction, so you have to be normal to that. So it's okay for polar orbits, but for equatorial orbits, we can't produce north-south um, torques. So uh, it can't produce. It can't offset any torques in those directions. You've got to what the limitations are for for polar orbits. We're fine, but for equatorial orbits, we've got some some limitations there. And I said the strength of the spacecraft field um, is, is, represents the magnetic dipole moment. So we want to increase that strength of that magnetic field in order to be able to increase this dipole moment. So we're effectively orientating the spacecraft in a particular direction by increasing its magnetic field in a particular direction, or its dipole moment. But that's going to interact with other sensitive equipment on board the spacecraft. So we need to be conscious of that as well. Um, and then this is simply how it works. So it's effectively like the left-hand rule. We're looking at the electromotive force that's happening. If we drive current through, um, so if we've got a, a cable going through a magnetic field, then we've got a force that's acting on that. If we drive a current through that cable, um, and our magnetic field in this case is the Earth's magnetic field, so that's external. Um, and we are then pushing our current through our, our, the cables, windings of our electromagnet, and that's generating a force, an external force on the spacecraft. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So, so we can estimate that based on uh, the torque that we create is based on the number of windings. So the more coils we have, the greater the torque we'll create. So if you've got very fine cable, we can have much more winding. So you've got more, basically more crossing of this cable that's carrying a current through the magnetic field lines, which means you're getting more torque. Okay? The current as well. So you can either have, uh, you could balance that. You could have more windings or a thicker um, cable that can carry greater current. Um, and then the cross-sectional area gives us this all of this gives us the, the sort of talk that we can estimate from that. Oh, so any questions around that? Are we happy with that? Yes? Okay. Um, we looked at last week how we can use gravity gradients as well to orientate the spacecraft. So our spacecraft can be orientated if it's very long, or it has a long slender geometry like this, it will orientate itself naturally within the gravitational field. Because that's just because the difference between uh, the gravitational force here on the spacecraft and the gravitational force here causes this torque which moves the spacecraft. 
Okay? So it's a passive technique because we don't need any power in order to do this. But we do have a very need to have a very good control on the spacecraft geometry. So it might, might create a spacecraft geometry that's not optimum necessarily because in order to do this we need a very long slender geometry. You might have a semi-passive system that has um, these, these arms that could move in and out and that could change the, the sort of how well a, the spacecraft is orientated along that gravity gradient and, and could reorientate itself. But generally, passively, you would just want to have it sort of fixed geometry and it orientates itself. Um, so the axis with the maximum moment of inertia will align to the normal. And uh, we looked at last week, but the force that's acting on it is related to the, uh, the um, Earth's magnet, uh, sort of mass parameter um, and the radius squared. So, so as we get further away, this force is going to get weaker and weaker. So, so it's good closer into the Earth, but as we get further away. But that also sees why um, if we have longer and longer geometry, we're going to get a bigger difference in this force and this couple and create this moment. Um, so we can then work out what the resulting moments are based on uh, the moment of inertia around the z-axis and around whatever axis you're trying to move, so the y-axis maybe in this case, um, is related to these angular differences. Okay. We can get these um, sort of un, uh, undesirable uh, motions, called, one is called libration, so it's a bit like that coning that you saw from the, the gyroscope, this is where the spacecraft kind of spins around in a, in a cone-like motion, just because it's spinning, sort of, um, it's, these torques are acting on it to cause it to, to spin, not, not just um, normally in the Earth's, uh, Earth's gravitational field, but it starts to kind of um, cone around, which is not ideal. And we can work out, and this is generally because we've got some sort of asymmetry between the x and the y axis, and that might be because we've got some sort of components aboard there that we can't kind of make it nicely symmetrical. Um, and that, then we get this liberation, which we can work out depending on what that sort of differences are between our x and our y axis. And it's related to, then to the mass moment of inertia of our y axis and the mass moment of inertia of our z axis. We can work out the angular rate of that or the frequency of that liberation. And we can then, we might need to use some sort of reaction wheel or momentum wheel to damp that out. So we might need, need some external, some other systems on board in order to be able to damp that. So although it's passive, we may have to have something in order to control a little bit. Any questions around that? Yes. Yep. What's the difference between lowercase r and capital R? Uh, so this is just when we're having a small force. We're looking at all of the elemental components and we're looking at this, uh, the, the difference in change in, in R, whereas this is the absolute, so this is the actual radius of the orbit. So R squared is the distance between a certain point mass, dm. In relation to the center of the Earth. So that's the, rate, the absolute radius of the orbit is R, is big R cubed, whereas R squared is this this relation with small changes in orbital radius. So R squared is equal to orbital, is equal to the orbital radius of a single tiny point of mass of the Earth. From lo of lots of, yeah, so we, we um, look at all of the change, the change in force for all of those little different point masses along that, along the length of the spacecraft. And we can get the, the change in force that's acting along the space, length of the spacecraft and, and that gives us the torque that's acting around the spacecraft. Yep. Any other questions? No? Okay. Okay, so we will move on to thrusters then. So where we might mount our thrusters um, are typically you'll see thrusters sort of mounted on the corners of the spacecraft. Um, this is to create the biggest moment arm. So the furthest away we can get it from the center of mass will create the biggest moment so our thrusters doesn't need, doesn't need to produce as much thrust. Okay. It might be you're restricted, so you may need to move that thruster closer, and then you'd need more thrust in order to generate the same amount of torque. But you'll see these thrusters in pairs or in couples creating torque. And it would have to be, if you had, 
If you wanted full uh, three-axis control, you'd have to have all of them, um, a whole set mounted on each four corners uh, of, the, of the spacecraft like that. Um, so they're mounted either on the spacecraft surface or in clusters on the corners. And it's called the Reaction Control System, RCS. You'll see that sort of acronym used quite, quite a lot, um, Reaction Control System. It can be used, as I said, for repointing or to dump built-up momentum in momentum wheels. So you could just use it for doing some sort of slew manoeuvre, some absolute manoeuvre, or you might need to use it to, to dump momentum over time. Um, and one of the advantages of thrusters is that torque level is totally independent of altitude. Okay, so we're not then confined by what altitude our orbit is um, to give us that torque. Um, sometimes the magnitude of that thrust is fixed. Okay, so the thruster will produce a certain amount of thrust. And you can generate the absolute magnitude if you start pulsing it. So you can pulse that thruster over a very short, uh, quick period. Um, and that's the, the longer the duration of that pulse, the absolute kind of torque that you're creating will, will increase. So if you reduce that, that pulse duty cycle, then you can change that torque level. But the thrust of the thruster is the same. Okay? So it's just saying, how long are you putting the thruster on for to generate a torque on the spacecraft in order to change the level of torque that you might need? So if you're using it for pointing, then as I mentioned before, we get this thing called a limit cycle. So imagine you've got a direction that you're pointing at. Your sensor is telling you you're almost there, but you need to do another maneuver just to get it kind of right on. And then suddenly you've overshot. And then you need to go back a bit. And then you need to go back. So you get this thing called jitter, where it's kind of continuously trying to keep its pointing direction. So that's where it's good to kind of your thruster to get you to your uh, close to your initial direction, but then you might want to use reaction wheels or momentum wheels to actually give you that final control. Because if you use thrusters, you'll get into this sort of bit where the thruster is continuously firing in order to try and maintain that. You can manage this a little bit by having what we call dead bands. Okay, so these are regions where you're happy if the if the orientation of the spacecraft moves a little bit out from that absolute direction. It won't, it won't kind of try and make a maneuver if it slightly drifts out. So that's okay, because then, then you don't get this sort of chitter chatter on the spacecraft thrusters, which kind of uses up a lot of fuel. But it, it can produce um, uh, this, this sort of motion of the spacecraft if you don't have these dead bands. That, that means it's kind of pointing, keeping on going from one side to the other to try and control its orientation. Any questions around that? No? Okay, I think we've got a couple of minutes left and one, I think one or two slides left. Um, so if we want to control uh, uh, so size thrusters for doing various maneuvers, we can consider what the thrust level is um, to do some sort of maneuver and consider it the thrust level needed to offset some sort of worst disturbance torque. And we've got to decide then what our moment arm is, so where we're placing that thruster in relation to the center of mass of our spacecraft. Um, then if we've got uh, some sort of thrust for doing a slew maneuver, if we've got no momentum bias on our spacecraft, so we're not using a, a momentum wheel to create some sort of attitude control, um, then we can work out the angular rate based on how quickly we want that maneuver to take place. Um, and we can decide how we do that maneuver. So we might want to have a region where we accelerate up to some point and then we just coast and then we have to decelerate. Remember, we're up operating in an airless environment. We're not going to have any drag acting on the spacecraft effectively or any other external forces generally. Okay, there may be some disturbances, but generally we won't have anything slowing that spacecraft down. So if we accelerate and spin it in one direction, we've got to decelerate it to stop it and make sure that it stops in a particular orientation. Uh, so we can decide some sort of profile, useful profile that we'll do. Um, and then we can get our acceleration rate. So we can work out how quickly we want that maneuver to take place. That gives us our acceleration rate. And we can then use the moment of inertia of the spacecraft to work out what the thrust is. 
we know, if we know spacecraft moment of inertia, we've worked out our acceleration rate for our maneuver, and we've de decided what our moment arm is, we can work out then how much thrust that thruster needs to do that maneuver. Um, I think we're running out of time. Have you got, you've got a lecture here next, <coughs> somewhere else next, have you? Yeah, okay, so I'll have to let you go. But the last few slides uh, basically tell you how you size it for a slew maneuver, okay? Um, and then how you, how you size all of these other components. We can look at that at the tutorial on Friday if, if you've got any further questions relating to the question of the tutorial. Um, or if you've got any other questions relating to these slides, which are up on Blackboard, you can have a look at them. Uh, let me know via Piazza and we can give you some answers. Okay. Yep. Wait, so, so in terms of the tutorial, I'd be a little bit worried about, about me messing things up just for the discussion. So if you've got any questions about the MATLAB coursework or the tutorial, please post them on Piazza and we can answer them, if you, particularly the format of how you, how you convey that. But we do have one final session on Friday that we'll go through and mop up any questions you might have before the submission deadline. Yes, it's only an hour long, so I, I suggest you're prepared or you ask some questions on Piazza if you've got anything that's really, really kind of worrying you. Really? Yeah. About the content? About mental health. Yeah. Wow. That yeah. is keen. So, well, yeah. That's why I couldn't understand your messages the other day. Yeah, which well, that's what you said.